Welcome to 2 Samuel, the second lesson in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 7 through 14. So we're going to step back in time a little bit here and go back to review some covenants because this uh, section of chapters 7 through 14 is a very central piece of Judaism, even up through today. And it's based on covenants that God has made with Israel. So if we think all the way back to Abraham, the first covenant that God made with Israel was with Abraham. God promised Abraham and Sarah many descendants and land for those descendants and that they would be blessed to become a blessing. The covenant required a sign, and as you may recall, the sign was circumcision of all males. <clears throat> you can review this back in chapter 12 of Genesis. The second covenant that God made was with Moses when they were on the way to the promised land. And this covenant was stating that the Lord would be their God and their leader, their king, so to speak. So he would be in the leadership role of the nation. The sign then was to keep the Sabbath. And you can review that in Deuteronomy chapter 5 if you're interested. But now we've progressed through time. And we are in a time where we have kings for Israel. We've had the King Saul, and now we have King David. And so things are changing. The um, country is evolving. And um, just like the lands around them, they wanted to have a king, and now they have one. So now when there's a king, he's the leader, direct leader of the people. And so he's like an interim between God and the people. So the king is in the middle. So with human kingship, rather than direct leadership by the Lord, as it had been under Moses and the judges, it required some adjustment to this covenants. So a new covenant was made directly with the king. And this new covenant is found in chapter 7 of the second book of Samuel. The covenant is considered one of the most important passages of the Old Testament by Christian theologians. It's a chapter with multiple meanings of the Hebrew word for house, which will set up the leadership and new covenant, what it means. So remember this word for house that in Hebrew is bet. So bet can mean a number of different things, just like in English we can use the word house and it could mean several different things. It can mean a physical building like the house you live in. It can also mean a family or a household, such as the house of my family or my parents. And a temple or a house of worship, such as a church, or a royal dynasty, such as, um, oh, say, the, the dynasty of the Bourbons from France in the Middle Ages. So it has a multiple meaning as bet or house. So with that in mind, the story in this story about the covenant, bet plays on all of these various meanings of the word house. David has moved to Jerusalem, so he has a household or a bet of children. He has a family. He has built himself a physical house, a bet, a cedar palace. And now David is thinking of building a house or a bet for the temple of God. As a temple of God. But when King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all the surrounding enemies, it says, the king summoned Nathan the prophet 
Look, David said, I'm living in this beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. So the ark of the covenant had been following along with Israel, as we've seen, and had been resting in uh, one of the outlying cities and then was going to be brought to Jerusalem, where David is now residing as the king. So I think about kings and prophets. They share power, but in they are in different roles. So the prophet spoke to God. So when the king wished to undertake a project, he must consult with God through the prophet. Even something as generous as a building a temple for God's house and the as God's house and the Ark of the Covenant must be consulted with God through the prophet. <clears throat> so Nathan is the prophet to David, and at first Nathan likes this idea of a house for God, and, but he finds out that God has other plans. In a dream, Nathan receives a message that becomes a new covenant promise. In 2 Samuel 7, verses 4 through 7, it says this, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? I have never lived in a house from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day. I have always moved from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained to tri Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people, Israel. I have never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? As he continues, I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people, Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. Now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived on the earth. And furthermore, the Lord declares that he will make a house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build a house, a temple for my name. <clears throat> so in, in these verses, God is reminding David of his humble origins. He reminds him that he took him from tending sheep in the pasture and selected him to be the leader of Israel. And he also reminds David that wherever you have gone and I have destroyed, uh, I have been with you and I have destroyed all your enemies before your eyes. And now I will make your name as famous as anyone who has ever lived in the earth. In fact, just as a little side note, David's name is mentioned only second to the name of Jesus in the Bible. So the things God has done for David include taking him from the pasture to make him a king. He's been with David, and he's cut off all of David's enemies. And he says that he, he continues saying that he will build him a house and a name forever and his throne will be forever. So this is the future promise. He will have a great name. David's name will be great. He will appoint a place for the people of Israel, and he will give rest from all the enemies. So we compare the covenant between Abraham and David. Abraham was promised a great name, and David is promised a great name. Abraham was promised land, and David is promised a place for Israel. Abraham is promised to have offspring or seed, 
children descendants, God, uh, David is promised a dynasty and offspring and descendants. So a royal dynasty is promised to David. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secure forever. Now the Hebrew word for anointing someone is masha. So the king was called God's anointed. And from this term came the word Messiah or Messiah. From the covenant with David, Israel began to hope for a Messiah to fulfill the promise that David's dynasty would rule forever. Jesus was from the line of David's household, and hope was upon him to be the fulfillment of the messianic promise of a new king for Israel. So this is why these verses in 2 Samuel chapter 7 hold such prominent place in Jewish um, history and in Jewish um, future, looking for the Messiah to fulfill this promise of the dynasty of David's household. So it gives hope, and in the circumstances surrounding the exile and its aftermath, Judaism relied on the promise of God to David for the hope that God had not abandoned this historical promise. Even when there was no political kingdom, there was a Messiah that would be coming from the line of David and a hope that God's anointed one would set things right. So this is written looking back upon the time that the people had been dispersed throughout the the Mediterranean region um, by the Assyrians first and second by the Babylonian empires. <clears throat> Here's a verse that's oftentimes read at Christmas and um, is part of the hope for the future from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 11, the first two verses. A shoot shall come up from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So this was for David, but it's also interpreted as meaning that out of the house of David in the future, there would still be a Messiah that would come. Now, this is something that I read on Richard Rohr's weekly um, communications that he has uh, that he sends out daily, and it, it was some time ago, but I thought I would save it because it seemed like it was appropriate. Um, at some time or another, would be appropriate for us to, to read. And it's called Stories from the Bottom. Richard Rohr shows us that one of the Bible's persistent themes is how God chooses the rejected, the outsider, and the unlikely person for grace and divine purposes. One of the few subversive texts in history is the Bible. The Bible is not extraordinary because it repeatedly and invariably legitimizes the people at the bottom of it, not the people at the top. Rejected sons, barren women, sinners, lepers, or outsiders are always the ones chosen by God. It's rather obvious when pointed out to us. In every case, we are presented with some form of powerlessness, and from that situation, God creates a new kind of power. <clears throat> and then just some examples might be um, people that we have looked at in our studies that seemed to be lowly but, but served um, God in a, in a leadership or in an important way to um, bring forth the, um, 
the way that God wanted things to go. So um, there would be Sarah and Abraham to start with, who were blessed with a child in late life. Um, the, the barren women often are mentioned, and that would be like Rachel and Hannah. And then we have characters like um, Esau and Jacob, and um, Jacob was second born, so but he turns out to be first in um, the in the work of the Lord. We have low born people like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and so on, and we and David, who was a she, just a lowly shepherd. So we could go on and name a whole bunch of these. And if you're interested in it, you can find this on Richard Rohr. That's called Bias from the Bottom. <clears throat> Sorry about my scratchy voice. So beginning in chapter 8 of 2 Samuel, after all this talk about the new covenant um, with David, there doesn't seem to be a real order for the rest of the two books uh, or the several chapters of Second Samuel. It's kind of like um, they annexed some of this information and it isn't necessarily in a straightforward order or chronological order. But it's like, okay, we have to annex, uh, put this appendix at the end of the chapters and make sure we remember all the details of things that David did. So they're kind of going to jump around a bit. So it's not just me. I want you to know who is looking at this and, and wondering what in the world is going on because it's kind of um, disorganized. But as I was reading through the commentaries and I got to the end, Walter Brueggemann made the same statement. And I thought, well, at least I'm not totally off the mark when I thought this was a little unorganized. And he said the same thing, that it was um, hard to follow and that it seemed to be just an adding on of information. So bear with me. This lesson and the next are kind of like that, where they're sort of disorderly. This is just a map, again, showing you the area of Palestine, Israel, um, and the area that supposedly King David had control over while he was, was reigning king. David showed mercy to the descendants of Saul and Jonathan by returning Saul's land to his grandson, and he was well, and the grandson was welcome at the king's court as well and ate at the king's table. So where does this come from? Well, back in first book of Samuel chapter 24, when David was in the cave and he could have easily killed Saul, um, he had the advantage but chose not to. And when Saul realized that, he said to David, that he recognized that David would eventually be the king of Israel. And so he said, Saul said to David, swear to me by the Lord that when that happens, you will not kill my family and destroy my line of descendants. So David promised this to Saul with an oath. And then Saul went home and David and his men went back to their stronghold. So they had been running, David had been running from Saul at that time. And so he'd made this promise, and now he's about to fulfill it by allowing Saul's grandson to return his properties and to invite him to be at the king's table. So in the writings in the books of Samuel are probably from after the exile, telling the stories of the times of the kings. David was favored for unifying the tribes and ushering in what would be looked back on as the beginning of a golden age of independence for Israel. The exiled people were longing and looking back to the times of the past. And the tribes of Israel 
were settling in the hill country of Canaan about at the same time as the Philistines were immigrating from the West. The Philistines are known from the records of Egypt and Assyria. They brought a culture that was distinguishable from the indigenous populations in Canaan. So the pressures from the Philistines may be one of the biggest reasons the tribes wanted a king. With tribal competition all around, the added pressure of invaders and was just more than a judge could handle. A military and a leadership was needed for protection and further security. Let's take a look at David's line of descendants. We see that David's father was Jesse and he had brothers and sisters. And his sisters had children, but this one is most important right here. His sister Zer uh, Zeriah had three sons, Abishai, Joab, Eshel. Ash I'm not sure how to say it, but anyway, you I'm sure remember that we've talked about Joab and possibly Abishai as well. So these three brothers are nephews of David. So they play an important role, and we'll see more of them as we read, continue to read. David married many wives. That meant he had sons, and they are um, to succeed the king to the throne as the eldest born son. So in this case, the eldest born son is Ammon, because these are the wives of David here. So Ammon is the eldest. For some reason, this one is not mentioned as a contender for the crown. So it's possible that he died at a young age or something. He's not even really mentioned. And then second was Absalom. Third was Adonijah. And then we have these two, and they're not really mentioned either. And then we have Solomon. So there's this whole story revolving these three sons and these three nephews. So if you keep them in mind. And then Tamar. So we're going to talk about Tamar, which is an incident that reminds me very much of Genesis chapter 34, I believe it is, um, where Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, is raped and her brothers go out to take vengeance. Jacob doesn't have anything to say to Dinah, no comfort of any sort, but he reprimands his sons for having gone after the people in the village, the men in the village that had raped Dinah. <clears throat> so in here, we're going to have a story again of rape and this is Tamar. Tamar and Absalom are brother and sister. They both have the same mother. They both have the same father. It involves Ammon. Ammon is a half-brother because he has a different mother but the same father. So Ammon is half-brother to Tamar and to Absalom. And so... Keep that in mind as this terrible story takes place. And it's the story of Tamar is in 2 Samuel chapter 13. The pattern of Tamar's story is repeated in the story of many modern women who are the victims of rape or incest, yet whose experience has been denied or hidden. This text is not read publicly in church and it's seldom preached on. Persons experienced at Bible study in the church are often shocked to have this story called to their attention. They had no idea such a story was part of the biblical tradition. Summarizing the story, it's very modern. It would 
unfortunately, you know, the story of many modern women um, falls into these categories. So Tamar was sexually assaulted, and it was not by a stranger, but it was by someone she knew. This violation took place not in a dark alley or in a desolate park, but by a member of her own family in his home. Tamer was exploited through one of her most vulnerable traits, her kindness and her upbringing to take care of others. Tamar said no, and her no was not respected. When Tamar sought help, she was told to keep quiet. The process of achieving justice and restitution was taken out of her hands entirely and carried forward by her brother. It became a man's business. In the end, it was her perpetrator for whom her father mourned and not for her. And the end of Tamer's story happens kind of like she's not even there. To read of Tamer's pain can enable others to voice their own pain so that it is not born alone. If the church can be the place of such reading and such voicing, then there is hope that the church might provide a community prepared to take action against continued patterns of violence against women in our culture and to stand in caring support of those who have already been victimized. So Absalom, Tamar's brother, takes revenge. And it seems to be more like it's a matter of restoring family honor and securing his own place in the succession than a matter of solidarity with Tamar. So remember, he was second in line. Ammon was first and Absalom was second. He does take her into his house where he, she remains a desolate woman a term that indicates her status as a woman without hope of marriage or family who must live with a permanent public humiliation. So Absalom takes her into his family compound. However, because she's been raped, she is not eligible for marriage. And therefore, she is uh, living in humiliation of, of the society around her. So this reminded me of the story of Jacob, I mean, of Dinah, Jacob's daughter. And he was angry at his sons for the vengeance, but he never did express any concern for his daughter. So when David finds out about this, he keeps Ammon close to him because he knows that um, Absalom. He knows Absalom is a person of anger, quick anger. So Absalom is biding his time for two years, and then he takes his revenge by killing his half-brother Ammon. Although this act has the immediate effect of forcing Absalom into exile from Jerusalem, it takes place and places him next in the line of succession to David's throne. So it's more of a political move with the rape being an excuse to commit a murder and move Absalom up into the position of being the one who would inherit the throne. Now we've talked about these sheep sharing parties a little bit in the past. They must have been quite the to do. And um, so Absalom has property outside of Jerusalem, a ways away where he's been living. And he decides he's going to invite the royal household to this sheep shearing event um, at his, his home. So he, he um, finally has what his vengeance requires, the presence of Ammon away from the watchful eye of David in a location away from Jerusalem that would allow his own escape. So while there, Absalom ordered his servants to murder Ammon. And Absalom must um, go into hiding. 
This tragic story of revenge and murder is a link in the chain of violence that began with David's adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. Now David's two oldest sons have repeated David's actions. One has taken for himself the object of his sexual desire, and the other has killed for the sake of his own personal and political interests. Tragically, the result of following in their father's path is that one son is now dead and the other is in exile. The overriding message in this text is, once again, that violence leads to more violence. Then beginning in chapter 15, we read of more plans to depose King David. We'll take this up next week and we'll sum up the last years of David's rule. Thinking back to Deuteronomy, when we first talked about uh, what kings are supposed to be like when they enter into the land of Israel, uh, and the device that Moses gave, do you think that Saul and David have followed the rules that were laid out in Deuteronomy, the specifications for how a king should act? Something to think about. Okay. For next week, I suggested reading is Psalm 146 and any of the remaining chapters of the second book of Samuel that you haven't already read. I chose to share this verse for today. Do not repay anyone evil for evil but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. From Romans 12, verses 17 and 18. So former General and President Eisenhower made this statement. I hate war as only a soldier who has lived it can only as one who has seen its brutality, its futility, its stupidity. And prayer for all those who have suffered the atrocities of war. Help us recognize their suffering and be reminded of your call to peace. And our final joke. Have a blessed week. I will see you for the next lesson.